Okay. <clears throat> Hello. Good afternoon. This is uh, Professor Ulysses S. Grant. <clears throat> I still haven't shaved my face. Today is, today is Sunday, but in Canada it's Saturday night, and there's a really important thing happening. Uh, there's a hockey game. There are hockey games, but for me, <clears throat> there's one particular game. Uh, as I mentioned, this is an experiment. This, this is a social, personal experiment that's happening, and uh, <clears throat> I can't shave until uh, my hockey team uh, is knocked out of the playoffs. So that's how we're going to start today, uh, discussing hockey. This is a sport is a very big part of British and American culture. We'll get there. Uh, we're on pace right now. I know a lot of the things have been very historical. We've talked a lot about kings and presidents and queens and that kind of thing, writers. Um, but we're going to move into the 20th and 21st century soon. Uh, this lecture is actually supposed to close the book on the 19th century, pretty much. So uh, we are going to talk about some things like like fashion and technology and sport, which perhaps will be more interesting to you. I don't know. Some students have said uh, it's very, it, uh, they're very interested. One, <clears throat> one of the the guys in the class actually um, said to me in a, an email, uh, not in an email, in the, in your in your assignment, said that um, he was very interested in medieval stuff. Uh, Chaucer. That just I love that. I love that when somebody says they they love Chaucer, and you know, um, Korean is your first language, and. Uh, Chaucer is the father of the English language. He's like, there's no King Sejong, right? Who created the English language. So we have just these really important writers that decided to write in English instead of writing in Latin. Chaucer, that's why I mentioned Chaucer in this class, Geoffrey Chaucer, because he wrote in Middle English. He wrote in a, he, he was the one who sort of put together the vocabulary of you know, the French influenced English. And there was no dictionary back then or anything. It wasn't like uh, Hangul that was created where the, these characters and stuff came into existence all at once. It was kind of a process, but he, Chaucer was one of the most important people in, in, um, in that process, right? Shakespeare, of course, too. Um, but Chaucer is <clears throat> the one that Shakespeare kind of looked to for inspiration when he was creating his own material. So <clears throat> let's, okay, let's go back to the, the present uh, topic, which is over here. We, we, uh, I failed to get to the frontier in the lecture on Friday. So that's what I want to talk about um, today. I want to talk about the frontier. Um, <clears throat> uh, just, there is a, uh, I'm searching to make sure that I get the dates right here. Uh, <clears throat> there's a there's a frontier thesis. There's an idea about the American frontier that was proposed by um, Frederick Jackson Turner. Okay, I, I don't expect you to remember his name, so don't worry about that. I'm just you know throwing it out there. Um, frontier thesis. So this is, it's kind of, I, I think for, for understand, if you really want to understand American culture, uh, there's a lot of aspects, right, that we've been talking about. One of the things I mentioned already is this idea of contradiction. And I'm not saying, this is not like uh, historical fact. I'm not saying there's only one way to understand American culture. I'm saying that we need multiple ways, right? One of the reasons that in your British uh, symbol assignments, I asked you to talk about the social, cultural, and historical context of some event, person, or, or symbol, like some sort of thing related to British culture is because I, I want you to uh, get 
into, I want to get you to be able to understand things um, with, with these kind of tools, right? There's, it's, it's almost like um, there's, a, there's no formula, there's no correct answer when somebody asks you a question, when you're, the same thing goes for Korean culture, when somebody asks you a question and, <clears throat> and you want to explain like what Korean culture is, there's no right or wrong answer to that, but you use different things to, as examples for, I just said, you know, King Sejong, uh, Lee Sun Shin, or Hangul, these are, these are kind of iconic um, Korean elements of Korean culture, right? So one of the things about Korean culture is uh, Neo-Confucianism and Buddhism and the fact that Japan is on one side, China on the other, and Korea is kind of like, you know, trapped uh, or, or struggling between these forces, right? These are things that people who've lived in Korea for a while, it, as foreigners, we come to appreciate because it's just something that Koreans naturally feel, right? It's just, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a kind of tension between Japan and China all the time and Russia, right? And Korea's in between, you're a, you're a peninsula. It, so, you know, um, the same thing goes for British culture. You know, we talked about how the fact that they're kind of on the edge of Europe and Ireland's behind them and Scotland's above them. And like, uh, there's always this concern, right? Um, back, going back a thousand years, that there's this concern about the Vikings, right? That's the most important thing. And then it turns into, you know, being worried about the French, being about, you know, a relationship between continental Europe and, and Britain. So <clears throat> the United States has this, these elements that uh, are fundamental to their culture too. Contradiction is one of them, right? And, and it's built into the, the DNA of America that one of the things I said is, is slavery, right? The fact that freedom, freedom is a fundamental, right? Freedom, which, which means many things. It means like the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> freedom means you, the, the choice, right? The opportunity. These are important ideas opportunity and independence I can go on right uh, individuality <clears throat> natural rights these things are all um, liberty okay <clears throat> these things are all essential to what being an American citizen, a person who lives in America is, but they, they constantly uh, conflict, right? They can constantly conflict because all of these things, slaves didn't have them, right? And I said, we talked about Ireland last week. The Irish weren't given these things either. Just, they're just, um, it's, it's almost like you can compare this to the, the healthcare system. So uh, one, of, one of the students asked me at the end of class, because we ran out of time on Friday, what the next, what you were supposed to, professor, you were supposed to explain about the next uh, assignment. This is the next assignment. Talking about a, an American contradiction, okay? So here, here's an example. The healthcare system of the United States, they medically, in terms of technology, in terms of like service and, and surgery, like the, the American, ha American healthcare system is the best in the world, right? The, the, you know, even though they, they messed up the coronavirus, you know, situation, uh, that was related to political decisions. It wasn't related to the capacity of the American medical system. They, they had, you know, millions and millions of people sick. At one point in the United States, they had like 20,000 people in ICUs, right? An ICU is an intensive care unit. The United States had 20,000 people in intensive care units. 
at the same time. You know what the capacity is in Korea? It's like a thousand because of the coronavirus, they increased it. They had 20,000 people. 20,000 people in individual intensive care units at the same time. No country in the world can do that. And still, still almost a million people died. Isn't that a contradiction? When they have the best healthcare uh, capacity in the world, but everybody's dying anyway, you know? <clears throat> this is private healthcare system. So what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that some people have access to the best healthcare in the world in the United States, but most people don't. This is the inherent contradiction. Inherent. Okay? It means it, it's, it's there. It's not, people are not making it. Inherent means like inherited. It's just that it's been there and it continues to be there. The only reason that uh, there's decent social welfare and healthcare and other things for the public is because of the depression, the Great Depression and, and um, the president we will talk about, we'll have to talk about. I know I said we're going to talk about sports and fashion and entertainment and stuff, more interesting things, but we have to talk about some very important individuals and uh, FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Roosevelt, he will become president in uh, the Great Depression in the 1930s. And he is just, he's my favorite president. And you know, I study this stuff a lot. So that means Abraham Lincoln is probably number two. Um, definitely number two. Uh, everybody has their own opinion, but FDR, is, it, it, he was uh, an incredible individual. And to do all the things that he did uh, is extraordinary. One of the things that he did is he, he made all of these social welfare programs and they really haven't improved. That was in the 1930s, right? Korea was being occupied by Japan. You had no democracy, you had no anything. At that time, America was going through this crisis, economic uh, social crisis called the Great Depression. It was an awful situation. And, and the, one of his solutions to that was to, to pro provide support for the people. Um, <clears throat> but there's this thing <laughs> Excuse me. Wow, that's never happened in my video before. Excuse me. Um, there's this, the, there's this obsession in America with the private versus public sphere. They're they're literally obsessed with it. That um, Adam Smith, I mentioned, it's in the textbook, and and um, capitalism and the free market is something that is very closely connected to what um, United States is, right? That it's, it's, a, it's supposed to be a free market, but a, a, an actual free market is, is uh, impossible to create. Um, this idea of individuals having opportunity and, and being able to go from, you know, um, poor, uneducated immigrant to rich, powerful, you know, capitalist. It, it's, it's really, for the most part, it's, it's a fantasy. So, <clears throat> you know, um, America is called the land of opportunity. So behind, behind the, the Revolutionary War, behind that, it, it was partly the fact, it was death and taxes, as I've said many times. <clears throat> um, that was, th those were the main factors that were threatening um, British colonists. But uh, there's, uh, there's other things, right? One of them was that the British sort of, the British government expected uh, the, the, Brit the colonists, American colonists, they were still British citizens, uh, especially after the French were defeated, they, they expected them 
to not expand, not move over the mountains, not go west, and interfere with the lands that belong to the natives. That was um, part of their expectation. It was part of their policy that the, the interior of the United States would, would not be um, developed by, by the British, and it, and it wasn't. So the Americans, so the British colonists that wanted to become American, uh, they wanted that land. They wanted to move out there because that's the frontier. That's the edge, right? <clears throat> the edge is always moving west. And uh, that's why, we, we, you know, we have this thing, the Wild West and everything. They, the government, once they, they defeated the British and the West started to open up, they, they couldn't control what was going on, right? People were just moving out. And I'm, I'm in the middle of reading a book um, called The Prairie, which is um, by uh, a man named Cooper. Um, he, also, he also wrote Last of the Mohicans. Um, it's, it's, it's a frontier lifestyle. And the, the main character is a, not the main character. <clears throat> one of the characters is a squatter and one of them is a trader. And so, um, you know, we talked about, we talked about uh, a little bit how Benjamin Franklin was kind of like dressed up like, you know, somebody who lived in the woods. And we're going to talk about Paul Bunyan and we're going to talk about um, Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. These guys are like, they're hunters. They become like half, half native, okay? Something like that. They, these guys, um, the, tra the trader, the trapper, he's out in the frontier because he's interacting Basically, he's just living off the land. He's, he's, he's a, he's a in, in Canada, we call him coureur de, coureur de bois. Coureur de, the wood, coureur, I can't even remember how to spell it. Coureur de bois. In French Canada, there was these guys, they, they chop down trees and they trap animals and they hunt and they trade with the natives and, and they, they just live in the forest. They're for literally this means like running in the forest. They're people who run in the forest. This is a very similar lifestyle to what the natives, you know, the natives have their own lifestyle, but then the Europeans come and they trade with them and they give them guns and horses and, and they start to like, you know, adapt this kind of hybrid lifestyle. This is the, the middle. A, a squatter though, a squatter is somebody who just goes on the land and he stays there, like squats. Squats means, like if you go to the gym, squats means like uh, lifting heavy things while you bend your legs. But squatting really means like staying in one place and staying low. And if you stay on the land, there's a law, actually, there's a squatting law. You know, if you stay on a land for like five years or 10 years, it, it becomes yours. If you occupy this land, there's, there's actually a legal thing. So they, they would, you know, the, the people who didn't have land in Virginia or New England or Georgia or the Carolinas, they would go west and then they would go to like land that belonged to the native people and then they would stay there for like five or ten years and like make a farm and build stuff and fight with the natives. And if they stayed there long enough, then that land became legally theirs. That was part of the process. So this idea that expansion, like there's always going to be more, there's going to be more uh, there's going to be more land. There's going to be more resources. The, the American frontier um, becomes fundamental to the, the idea of American culture. That they're going to expand west. And, you know, this idea starts with something called manifest destiny. Where, <clears throat> let me go to the other side of the board. Manifest destiny means that... Um, like the Protestant wind, remember when the armada, you know, the wind blows the armada up the channel and they have to go around the British islands and like all of their ships sink because there's a terrible storm. And when William, William III, when William of Orange comes and James II is, is going to stop him, uh, 
the ships, the, the wind goes the other way. It blows out to the Atlantic Ocean and keeps James's, the, the fleet, the royal fleet in the harbor in Plymouth, in Portsmouth, right? And, and then William can land safely. And once he lands his army, which is a better army, it's game over. That's a, the Protestant wind, like working. And that was 1588 and 1688, right? Like they, they, um, this is hardwired into their, their brains that God is, has chosen them to do something. And who wouldn't do that, right? Like everybody believes in luck a little bit. You, you put on like a, your, your lucky socks and then you, you write an exam and you, you get a, an A plus, then you wear those socks the next time you write an exam. It's like, um, you know, when you do the sunung, all of Koreans know this. I know some of you are not Korean, but um, Koreans always uh, prefer on a, on a test day to like have sticky things, right? Something sticks, uh, slippery things like miyaku or anything that makes you, might make you fall or fail. You don't touch those things or eat those things on uh, a test day. You all know this, I think. And, you know, um, con um, on, on the other side, the, the, the good luck things are sticky. So like if you get like a dop, like rice cake, something really sticky and you eat it or somebody gives it to you, it means that they, they expect you, you know, to remember, like stick, memory, um, do well on your test. It's the same kind of stuff, basically. Um, but this, it's re this is religiously oriented, so it's even stronger because they, they believe that it's not luck. They believe that God has almost commanded them to do this. Like it's their, almost like their responsibility. They have to develop America. They have to take it over. The native people are not worthy of this great land, but the English are, okay? So it, it's in, it's, we're gonna get into the 20th century and like there is a, ab, uh, there's definitely a racist um, aspect. There's a discriminatory aspect to it. And, and um, because of the disease, the terrible diseases and the lack of immunity amongst the natives, their, their population collapses, completely collapses. I've mentioned this already. So that the land is unoccupied, basically. 90% of the people that lived in America died. So when the Americans go west, it's empty. Not only do they think that the native people are culturally backward and they're undeveloped and that uh, civilized, the British civilization and American civilization and, and the Western way is better. They believe that all, and, and the, the situation seems to agree with that idea, right? Because everybody's, there's nobody there. there. There's people, but there's, they're very, the population is very, ex extremely uh, low. Like you go to Mongolia and they have a low population density, naturally, right? That's the way that America was, the prairie in the interior. It was already um, a sort of difficult place to live, right? It, it's um, really hot and dry in the summer and in the winter it's very cold it's a harsh environment and the natives lived there and then of the natives that lived there most of them died so now you have like a harsh and a difficult environment to live in which human beings mostly have you know died from disease so it, it's it looks to them it looks to the settlers the squatters the American citizens that they won the war against Britain. So now they're free to do what they want. The land is unoccupied and the people that are there are, are underdeveloped and not using the land properly according to their idea. So they believe that this future, this purpose has manifested itself um, without just, it's appeared, it's, it's there. And that's so that it's their almost like their duty, right? It's their, they have to follow their future purpose. That's what the destiny manifest destiny means. It's it's a a very 
uh, tragic and terrible event. Um, like I said before, Christopher Columbus sort of accidentally bumped into North America on trying to find India and, and he, he completely destroyed, you know, the civil, the, um, people that he encountered. And it wasn't really intentionally in some cases doing that. Um, but that's what happened anyway. So <clears throat> whether it was his uh, intention or not, doesn't matter. Um, now there's in chapter six, uh, in chapter six here, this will be Wednesday when you watch this lecture. <clears throat> in chapter six here, um, we went over the Civil War. Um, the frontier gets opened up um, after the American Revolutionary War, and then it sort of just gets the the progress gets gets accelerates in the in the antebellum period before the Civil War. And it, and it kind of pauses for five years and then it resumes. Um, so throughout the 19th century, there's westward, there's a creation of new states, right? Um, one of the biggest events is uh, the creation of Texas, which Texas is, was a part of the Spanish empire. Um, <clears throat> and it, it really, I mean, Tex, I don't, I can't go into the details too much, but Texas, tried to make its own country, essentially, at one point. Um, and then there was a struggle between the Spanish um, the, and the Americans. Uh, they're Mexican. It's a, it's, they're Mexican at this point. I shouldn't be saying Spanish. They're speaking Spanish, but they're not part of the... Mexico becomes independent, but Mexico is enormous. Uh, when it becomes independent, it's bigger than the United States. Um, they, um, through the Louisiana Purchase, Thomas Jefferson adds the Mississippi, you know, the, the interior, the, the most important area um, <clears throat> for expansion is this gigantic river called the Mississippi. It's, it's like the, the Han River, but a lot bigger, and it has a huge basin. It's the biggest river in North America. The interior of the of United States, all of the rivers go into Mississippi and they, they funnel down into the Gulf of Mexico. When that goes from Spanish territory uh, to French territory and then Napoleon sa sells it to America, that opens up the door for, you know, the Mexican state, the new Mexican state to be directly in conflict with Americans. So there's a lot of Americans moving into the area in Texas that's part of Mexico, sort of illegally squatting. So, um, and unlike, unlike the natives, Mexico is, has an army with lots of guns and they have horses and, and so they, they have a war. There's an American-Mexican war, which we're not gonna get into very much, but the result is the Americans win um, for a variety of reasons, the Americans win, but there's, there's this certain event um, that's commemorated in 1836, part of the Texas Revolution. It's on page 192, um, that there's a, a battle called the, at the Alamo. Uh, and basically there's like 600 Mexican soldiers and a, less than a hundred Americans and they fight to the death. It's, it's kind of like a, you know, if you've seen the movie like 300, Sambek, um, where, the, where the Spartans fight against the Persians and there's thousands of Persians and there's like, there's only hundreds of Spartans and their allies and they, they stop the per Persians for a week and, and they, in the end, they all get killed. Every, I think there's only two of them that get away in the, in the story, in the Greek event when they fight Persia. Two of them get away and one of them kills himself and the other one is, is like, a, so basically ostracized by everybody else. So essentially they're all dead. <clears throat> the 300 Spartans all die. And in this case, um, this event, this sacrifice by the American soldiers where they fight and stop the Mexicans for a week. And in the end, all of them get, when they, when they run out of bullets and the Mexicans take the, 
the, the, the uh, town, the building, they kill them. So they all die. And um, the Americans end up with it, winning and they, they, they remember the Alamo is a sort of catchphrase that signifies um, this American um, sacrifice, military and, and um, personal sacrifice for the growth of a nation. So, you know, remember the Alamo, again, it proves to the American people, it proves that it is their destiny. Texas belongs to America. California belongs to America. Shortly after they defeat the Mexicans, they take a huge amount of territory, Arizona and New Mexico, and it's just a complete disaster for Mexico. And um, they, Americans get California. That's why we have San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Jose. These are Spanish names. They're, I mean, there's a lot of people who speak Spanish in California now, um, but it was originally developed, started to be developed by the, uh, the Spanish and then the Mexicans. They take over California and then immediately they find gold. And this just continues to reinforce this idea that the frontier needs to, we need to grow. We're supposed to grow. This is a, this is a project. This is a destiny. This is the future of the United States. Um, my favorite football team is the San Francisco 49ers. They're called the 49ers because in 1849, uh, many, many people rushed into California to find gold. And those people were called the 49ers. They're, they're miners that are looking for, for, to find gold. So uh, California has a population explosion. Even people are coming from China. Um, people are coming from from New York. People are just like bankers and wealthy people are, I mean, this is not all in every case, but a lot of people are just, they're coming there to, to the land of opportunity, right? They're coming to see if they can win the lottery, they can become rich. They can find, they can go to a river and they can pan and then like a big nugget of gold worth like, you know, in our day, in our, our money, like a million dollars. They're, they're trying to, it's, and it's terrible. There's bears, there, it's freezing cold in the winter. There's thieves, people are killing each other. It's, it's, uh, it's a big risk, but there's a huge number of people that um, go crazy. They go crazy because of the chance of finding gold. It's called the gold rush and that's in uh, our textbook as well. Uh, it's on page 198. And, you know, everybody knows uh, the Chinese love gold um, in particular, but I know from being in Korea, Koreans love gold too. It's like a symbolic thing. Like if you have gold, then, you know, like if you have a nice house or whatever, you know, that's also a symbol of wealth, but like um, gold, like my gold necklace here, like this is, this is people who are poor don't wear gold. People who are rich wear gold, you know? It doesn't matter if it's America or China or Korea. That's just, they came, America, they, they came. The Virginia company came to, right? Um, in, six, in the 1610s, 1620s, 400 years ago, they came to find gold because in Mexico they found gold and in uh, Peru they found silver and the Spanish became rich. So, you know, the original reason that America sort of started is because they were looking for gold. King James took over the company because they failed to find gold and they didn't make enough money. It's at the root of the entire culture. Okay, <clears throat> um, now the, to, to talk about the natives, you're gonna have to read, and I will talk about this on Friday a little bit more. I'm gonna make this lecture less uh, shorter than, than the typical one. Um, we have quiz number six. Uh, when I upload this on Wednesday, you have to do your last quiz. Excuse me. And um, you have to um, <clears throat> you have to prepare for that. So I don't want to make this lecture super long. But um, if you take a look on page 216, right here, right at the end of chapter six, because we're trying to 
put the uh, conclusion on this 19th century and this chapter, uh, you can see how many tribes there are, how diverse it is. It's, it's even more because <clears throat> there's no empires, there's no like big states or anything. It's not like the French empire, the British empire. There's just, you know, um, a thousand different people. The, the, the diversity, they, they have big groups and, uh, and they're in big, the Apache, the Pawnee, the Sioux, um, the Cree, the Blackfoot. These are in big letters because they're bigger tribes and they're, they're famous um, for certain things. So in, at the end of this chapter, I, I sort of choose, I took the Arawaks. I tried to, you know, there's, I can't talk about a thousand different tribes. So um, the Arawaks, the Iroquois, the Sioux, the Algonquin and the Apache. That's what I chose. Those are the groups I chose. They don't represent every aspect, but they're the big famous tribes that, you know, um, they had almost like a confederation. They, they had, there were multiple groups that speak the same language and they were powerful, numerous tribes, uh, people. And um, yeah, they all, they each have, sort of special abilities, special characteristics, and, and they're all attractive and interesting in their own way, and all of them still exist. Um, the Mohicans were uh, one tribe that was part of the Iroquois Confederation. So they're, you know, some in the Sioux also, they had the Lakota, the Dakota, the Teton, these are all tribes that together made up the Sioux Nation. And they, these tribes, all of them, in, in some, in one situation or another, they fought. They fought against the French, they fought against the Europeans, they fought against the British, they fought against the, they, they were strong enough and, and had a, uh, enough power to try and resist uh, against the settlement and the development of America. So in the 1890s, <clears throat> this frontier will be closed and the last um, native nation, the last Indian American Indian nation, the, pa the Apache will surrender to the, they're the last ones that are kind of, with, there's an expression in America and American, you know, there's an American, in, in, uh, there's a, an American idiom called to go off the reservation, <clears throat> which is, is not a great expression because it's, you know, um, discriminating against natives because that's what they did. They, they created a space and said, stay on in this area and don't come out. This is your territory. We give it to you. It's a reservation. It's a, re it's a native reserve. But they didn't give them the best land. They didn't give them enough space <clears throat> for them to do, uh, you know, to live their lifestyle. So the Apache, of course, left the re reservation regularly, attacked other people, stole horses, or did whatever, hunting uh, off the reservation. And going off the reservation means like going crazy and breaking the rules. But of, of course, who wouldn't do that? We talked about uh, the slaves. Like, if you were a slave, you would either just give in and be depressed and work like with no hope or no future, or you would rebel and try and kill your master. Um, and so the natives did the same thing. They, some of them gave up and just tried to assimilate, tried to become more like Americans. The Cherokee um, are famous for that because they, they actually started writing all the native tribes, they, none of them, recorded anything or wrote anything, but the Cherokee made a newspaper and they, they made write, wrote their language down in, in English, right? So that people could read, you know, about them and their ideas and their, their, their culture. And they tried to, you know, become part of Georgia. I know there's one student who lived in Georgia in this class. <clears throat> they, that's where they lived. The Cherokee lived in Georgia and they tried to become like uh, American citizens. And you know what happened? Uh, President Andrew Jackson <clears throat> ignored their claims to land and property 
uh, and territory within Georgia, and they were told to um, evacuate, to leave. They were exiled from their own land. Even though they tried to become American, they were not accepted. Andrew Jackson was a, a military, who was a general in the American military and uh, notoriously racist, didn't care about um, anybody besides the Anglo-Americans. <clears throat> and, um, you know, when the, George, when the state of Georgia decided to expel them, um, they just, the military just said, leave, and they, they had to march. And, and uh, there was, many of them died. They had to march to a completely new territory where there was natives already living in, in you know, in the, the west of the Mississippi. Uh, they marched them from their land that they'd had for hundreds of years and forced them to live uh, to leave, and that is called that's called the Trail of Tears. <clears throat> that is um, on page two hundred and fifteen. So these are all significant things that that happened in the nineteenth century. The Alamo. We talked about the Civil War, the California Gold Rush, and um, cowboy culture. I mentioned that as well. How you know we've glorified the cowboys. Everybody thinks cowboys are cool and handsome and awesome and the reality was quite the opposite hollywood has created this kind of myth of the cowboy um which most people subscribe to but the reality is they were quite um unattractive people i would i will say okay so that's the end of chapter six and good luck please do a good job of your last quiz and because after that you don't have to worry about quizzes just our last assignment and, and the final exam. So thank you for listening. Uh, again, this will be posted on Wednesday and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend and the beautiful weather uh, before it gets too hot. I'll see you on Friday.